Hi everyone, thanks for joining and welcome to our panel on risks to fact checkers and fact checking at internet scale. And thanks to everyone at IFCN and Stage 10 for setting this up. I'm Phoebe, I work with the automated fact checking team at Full Fact. Um, one of our current projects is adapting the tools that we use in-house for fact checkers to get them working in French. And for this panel, I'm excited to be joined by Eric Magendi, the managing editor of Pesacek in Kenya, Govind Etheraj, co-founder of Boom and Fact Checker in India, Gulen Chavush, the editor-in-chief of Tayet in Turkey, Nishant Lawani, who leads Luminate's global independent media program, and thanks to Luminate for funding part of this conference, and Tiana Svetchechenin, co-founder and editor of two fact-checking websites in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Istnomia and Raskrin Kavanye. So let's get into the discussion. We're going to look at questions related to how fact checkers work with internet companies, including independence and sustainability. And we're gonna be thinking about how we might want to work with these companies in future. And then a quick explanation of what we mean by internet scale fact checking. For me, this is about the fact checking um, or the use of fact checks beyond our websites. So how we can get our fact checks to a mass audience using technology. At the moment, a lot of us use things like claim review or Facebook's fact checking product to scale our work online. So first, I'm going to invite our five panelists to give an opening statement about the risks and opportunities for fact checkers working with internet companies to scale our fact checks online. And then later on, we'll be having a Q&A and taking some questions from the audience. So get asking. And first, we're going to ask Eric to have two minutes on the risks and opportunities for fact checkers. Thanks, Phoebe. So my name is Eric Mugendi. I'm the managing editor of Pesa Check, and uh, we're based in Nairobi. And we do fact checking on initially budget and public finance claims, but we grew our focus into more general fact checking. So we are actually on the Facebook third party fact checking program. So I think this is the most uh, uh, clear inter interaction we've had with fact checking at scale on the internet. And what that this has uh, done to us is it's grown our focus into more broad fact checking. So initially when we're looking at things that politicians were saying on how public finances are being used and how resources are allocated. But now we look at all sorts of claims. And uh, I'd say the, the biggest opportunity for this has been the chance to grow our audience. So we've been able to engage with a lot of people and uh, we've been able to sort of grow our reach in terms of promoting our content and getting more people to send us things that they want us to check that wouldn't uh, otherwise look into uh, previously. And uh, the other thing that uh, I'd say the biggest risk, the biggest challenge that we've seen is that a lot of times the, the content that we produce doesn't get as much reach as the, the fact checks that we, uh, we do. So in uh, what we end up doing is sort of chasing the false information and trying to figure out what exactly people are talking about. And so this playing catch up takes up time that we would uh, previously spend doing lots of research and looking into other fact checks that we could possibly do. So the, the broadened focus uh, has brought a lot of opportunities for new content, but then the challenge that it's brought with it is the, the fact that now we have to put in a lot more work into producing much shorter pieces to sort of keep up with the pace at which the false information is being generated. And uh, I'd say another thing that uh, we have actually been able to do is to use platforms like WhatsApp to engage with audiences. So that's another thing that's enabled us to grow our reach using technology. And uh, because of that, we've been able to sort of uh, transition and uh, in engage with people in uh, through a WhatsApp newsletter, which uh, we just started sending out uh, this month. And uh, because of that, we've been able to then get the, the things that people want to be looked into, the content that people want to be fact-checked. And we've been using that as a source and as a basis for the fact-checks that we're producing. Great. Thanks, Eric. That was really, really interesting. And we'll come back to some of those issues in our Q&A. Um, and next, I'd like to hear from Govind. Thanks. Uh, I'm uh, Govind Ajayatiraj. I'm the founder of uh, FactChecker.in, which is a fact-checking entity that fact-checks statements made by people in public life, as well as institutions, and also Boom Live, which essentially fights fake news and uh, also explains issues. So uh, we've been working with technology platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp uh, off late, but for us, right from the beginning, uh, 
technology platforms, uh, particularly Facebook, have not been the primary discovery tool. I mean, for most of our, for most of our stories in the beginning and even today, uh, we depend on a whole bunch of things, including our own tracking, our tracking of people, uh, bad actors, our WhatsApp uh, helpline, which is flooded now, which uh, wasn't the case earlier. So there are a whole bunch of sources. So uh, what are the risks? I, I think there are the, the fundamental risk is over dependence on any one source for information, uh, which I think is a fair risk if you were obviously too dependent on it, but it is not if you're not. But on the other hand, let's understand what the na nature of the problem is. The nature of the problem is that at least in much of the fact checks we do, we are dealing with a military industrialized fake news machinery. And that's something that cannot be taken on by small enterprises or for that matter, I would imagine even large enterprises uh, wherever they are. So we have to work uh, in conjunction with large technology platforms who can multiply the impact that we have by way of distribution and suppression of uh, content that is uh, evidently fake or uh, likely fake. So that, that, that's the first part. The second is, I think, is about uh, how do we make this partnership more effective? I think the way it can be made more effective is to get technology companies to share more real-time insights on what is happening on their platforms. Now, we've seen some changes uh, from earlier positions. I think uh, tech companies have become more uh, liberal and are willing to share more. But I think the journey is, uh, uh, is a long one and an evolving one. I think uh, a WhatsApp, for instance, can surely uh, give us more insights on what is happening, particularly if a certain kind of content is going to a million people, then it's very likely that it's uh, it's not in any more private domain, but is really in quasi-public domain. So now how do you share that with us without compromising your, uh, your first principles is something that we can work out, but I think needs to be worked upon. So there are many such things where, you know, data intelligence can be uh, uh, shared more real time, insights can be given real, more real time and help us go to the source of that fact uh, or that piece of fake news or misinformation faster so that we can respond faster and we can keep uh, our uh, readers, audiences, viewers, and the internet as a whole safer. I'll pause there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Govind. Um, and for everyone just joining, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're talking about the risks and opportunities for fact checkers of working with internet companies. And we just heard from Eric and Govind, and now we're going to hear from Gulen. Hi, Phoebe. And hello everyone, I'm Editor-in-Chief at Tate, Turkish Fact-Checking Organization, and we are focusing on social media and media contents mostly and fact-checking videos and photos. So partnership with Facebook is very helpful for finding out the suspicious contents, especially on this platform. And according to the State of Fact-Checking Report, um, for-profit fact-checkers uh, make up the majority of the organizations now and it's mostly because of the Facebook partnership and grants of the other platforms like YouTube, Google. And working with fact checkers is a really good step for them and uh, we all appreciate this, I'm sure. And people sometimes act like uh, fact checkers take dirty money uh, from the platforms. But the crucial point is what we can change and how can we empower the social media users or are we good at pushing platforms for system level change uh, with this money? So we are not just giving fact checking services to these platforms and we are trying to clean the whole information ecosystem actually. So relationship with the platforms is just a part of what we are doing. And as a fact checking platform, we really care about the uh, cleaning social media from this information. And also our communities also demand similar things from the platforms. For example, in the last Reuters Digital News report, people demand actions for false political advertisement, except Turkey, by the way. Uh, I guess you don't have to do something about political advertisement in Turkey uh, somehow. And I mean, uh, social media users also care about the step of uh, social media platforms. We are not alone uh, while carrying accurate information. And I'm sure platforms also care this because it affects them also. So it's really important to promote being transparent and demanding transparency from the platforms. Um, maybe might be the sh uh, smartest action. 
and what kind of impact we create is using AR or both working well and how much our efforts affect these kind of uh, technologies or when they plan to expand their program developments, new futures to the other countries unless US election won't happen. And what kind of market strategy they have when we are talking about the disinformation, when they uh, remove the contents or what kind of leader they uh, choose to protect or attack. So, and in what uh, circumstances um, uh, these platforms stop working with fact checkers? So it's basically rely on the transparency and health communication, I think. So uh, when we create this atmosphere, different financial or partnership model we decide uh, could work, but uh, in the financially, Facebook model is an opportunity to focus on uh, our work and it helps fact checkers to generate more income and what we publish. So uh, this uh, this is my uh, concerns and thanks. Thanks, thanks Gillian. There's loads of really interesting points there that I think we'll delve into later on in this session. Okay. Um, and next I'd like to hear from Nishant. Hey Nishant. Hi, thanks Phoebe. Um, so I'm Nishant Nawani from Illuminate and for those of you who don't know Illuminate, we are a philanthropic organization that uh, was founded by Pierre Midyar, who's uh, the guy who set up eBay. Um, it's one of his many philanthropic efforts. We focus on building stronger societies through uh, funding democracy, governance, and media work around the world. Uh, and uh, specifically around battling this misinformation, we fund a number of fact-checking organizations, um, including Full Fact, um, the International Fact-Checking Network, Africa Check, Check Yada, um, and others too. And we also um, are looking at kind of innovations in the space that can help scale fact checking, um, like the uh, the Global Disinformation Index, which doesn't exactly scale fact checking, but it it does try and filter out misinformation through um, machine learning tools. Um, so, in terms of today's discussion, um, obviously the effort to scale facts to ensure that the, the right people read them um, is a critically important public good. Um, for us to undertake uh, as a community. And I think fact-checking is a really key part of this, um, but naturally it's not the only part. Um, regulation of the tech platforms, media literacy, um, responsible independent journalism are all uh, really critical tools that need to, to come together to, to ensure that um, people are equipped with facts and that facts are reaching them. So when thinking through what uh, Personally, I'm looking forward to discussing today three things, really. Firstly, um, how sustainability for fact-checking organizations, um, because without um, those pathways, it's hard for um, those organizations to operate effectively, especially at scale. Secondly, uh, to understand where we feel the tech platforms are exploiting fact-checking and fact-checkers the community and, and what we can do about that. And thirdly, to understand what innovations are required to scale up fact-checking in a way that uses the platforms because we, if we need to use them. Thanks, Vic. Great. Thanks, Nishant. Yep, really great topics to get into a bit later. And then finally, Tiana, can we hear what you've, what your priorities are in this discussion? Hi, Phoebe. So, my perspective is somewhat different in that we are uh, we have two fact checking projects. One is focused on on statements of public officials, and another one deals with this information mostly from the media. And neither is onboarded on the Facebook's third party fact checking program, uh, despite one of them being quite old, ten years old actually. So the the priority for me is this position of doing fact checking in a, in a sort of a online periphery because if you're uh, if you're in the part of the world that is not currently that significant in any way that is political or economical or there's nothing really really bad going on that warrants like a more thorough response from from the companies the tech companies then there's certain type of neglect that you face from from like tech giants and we mostly are discussing facebook here because facebook has probably stepped in the most when it comes to to bringing fact checking on to their platform but quite not enough in in this part of the world so that is a uh, that is my priority is like how do companies uh, implement their duty of care depending on where you are in the world when it comes to everything from content moderation to cooperation with fact checkers to 
adds transparency, all other kinds of transparency that you can exhibit or not uh, when you're a big tech company. This is this is the the position that that uh, kind of we are put in, in in this discussion because that's the that's the consequence maybe maybe of uh, of uh, 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 even if your fact checking is at scale in terms of the, that the product that you are creating is very usable, is very uh, how to say we have like um, several countries speaking the same language, so it's it automatically international in some way. But you still do not see this. So you're not kind of uh, invited into the to the cooperation efforts that are existent for other parts of the world. So that would be like my area of priority in this discussion what happens when you're not on top of the list uh, when it comes to the the interests of, of the global tech companies great thanks tiana okay so quite a lot of things to cover so i think first what i'd like to look at is independence and editorial impact of these collaborations with internet platforms and i think um because we've got so many uh, panelists we're going to just have some at a time so for, these, for this section, I'm going to be looking for Govind, Eric, Gulin, and Nishant. Um, and the, yeah, the first question is about independence and editorial impact of working with internet companies. And for some context, I've noticed that, for example, at Full Fact, our overall output has changed since we started our partnership with Facebook. Um, and we now produce perhaps more Facebook fact checks than we do of other kinds. And I don't know if this has been discussed as a group while I was kind of out of fact checking and now I've come back. Um, but I was wondering, Govind, if you could talk me through how you think and whether you think fact checkers' editorial decisions are being shaped by these collaborations consciously and in ways that we're less aware of. So if, uh, if it's being shaped in ways that we are less aware of, I'm not aware of it. But uh, uh, I, I, like I said earlier, I think our dependence on the tool is, uh, has always been low. We've actually in some ways maybe provided more input into the shaping of the tool, at least in India, where we were the first to uh, be uh, uh, partnered with uh, Facebook. But I, I think the, the larger thing is, uh, you know, and this is a question that we have to ask ourselves and or remind ourselves. I mean, why were we set up? Uh, we were not set up to, uh, you know, be a service provider to platforms, uh, not that we are against it or are, are not enjoying it or uh, benefiting from it. But we were set up to fight misinformation. We were to fight. Uh, we were set up to uh, bring uh, and develop a niche of journalism which perhaps didn't exist in the manner that uh, that needs to exist today. And uh, and our our cause is to fight this at uh, whatever may be uh, the cost. And uh, today, uh, maybe the benefit is that uh, uh, the internet platforms are uh, partners with us or allies with us, and uh, it obviously helps because they magnify the impact. But on the other hand, if they were not there, uh, to me, uh, this the cause remains, and I only have to, uh, you know, recalibrate the way I do it and uh, and and how I do it. Uh, you know, under fact checker dot in, we, for instance, uh, fact check statements made by uh, people in public life. Now, that is something that is uh, has nothing to do with whether I have uh, a tech company as a platform or not. Uh, and uh, even, might, even as I might benefit from that. So I think uh, I, the way I see it, uh, editorial independence is really about how you look at the problem or if it is a problem, it's about how, it def how you define why you exist and uh, how you intend to take your organization forward and what is your medium to long-term view. And yes, tomorrow uh, for some reason, a certain chunk of income disappears. Sure, uh, but I don't. We are all of us. I think in the current form are only a few years old, except for maybe full fact, which is a little older. And uh, therefore, we have to align ourselves with whatever changes happen, and changes will happen. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, picking up on your point about uh, how these types of collaborations to scale fact checks online might affect your mission, Eric, what's your experience of that? So I completely agree with uh, with Govind because one of the things that uh, we were doing initially before we joined the the third party fact checking program was essentially so uh, it was very slow it was uh, because the sort of fact checking we're doing tended to rely a lot on public data and public information and one of the things that happens in Kenya is if you ask for public uh, for information that's meant to be in the public domain it often takes a while before you can get it so we had, uh, uh, like, at some point we were looking at really old and uh, not not old per se, but we were looking at conversations that were not uh, in the public uh, domain anymore. And as a result, the the 
we were trying to remind the people about the stuff that we were looking at. And uh, one of the things that tended to happen was uh, we often had to remind people this was a thing that this politician or this person had said, and this is why you should care about it now because the data just became available. But what we're seeing now uh, with the Facebook program is we, we're still producing the, the, the long form content that we were producing before. Uh, so, uh, but now we've augmented it with the, the third party fact checking content, which is quite a lot in terms of volume. So if you actually look at our site, you might actually see, you're much more likely to see the Facebook uh, third party fact checking content than you would uh, previously uh, with uh, the, the longer articles. And one of the, the things that we're also doing is expanding into more countries. And we're expanding exclusively for the purpose of the, the, the third party fact checking program and then introducing the longer fact checks as an additional service. And uh, because of that, because it takes a while to establish the, the previous form of fact checking that we did, for the time being, that's all that a lot of people are going to see. So I think in terms of getting people more familiar with our fact checking work, our collaboration with Facebook has been quite useful. But then we still have it in mind that we're not doing this forever because mm. uh, it all depends on what they want to achieve for the time being. If the goal changes by this time next year, we will have to change as well. We can't just keep doing the same thing. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, and finally, Gulen, oh, sorry, not finally, Gulen, um, the others have mentioned kind of ability to expand, um, trying to stick with their original mission and perhaps changes in editorial strategy. Have you experienced any of those in your collaborations with internet companies and their products? Um, actually, no, I totally agree with Eric and Govind. And with the Facebook partnership, um, actually we hired more people uh, in our editorial team and it changed the number of articles we publish. And before we have to strictly rule our priority criteria and focus a less number of uh, doubtful contents and the partnership uh, create uh, actually positive effect because it give a, uh, give a chance to interfere um, other echo chambers. Uh, and when uh, we vary the fact checking, we reach this uh, different uh, group of audiences. So we haven't changed the editorial decision uh, so much because since we have established state, we mostly fact check videos, photos, and social media contents and not the politician statements or else. So we haven't stretched our methodology. Uh, for platforms and we also have a chance to publish in-depth and impactful articles on different topics uh, with the freelance writers because this income helps us to hire freelance journalists so besides this collaboration help to reach more people and similarly claim we will also have a uh, same effect and help to enlarge our uh, audiences and when we are reaching more people um, also, we have a chance to deeper relations with the community. Uh, so uh, I can imagine some economic concerns while uh, publishing articles, but uh, the fact-checking organizations, I think, can find any uh, solutions to, uh, to deal with it. And uh, with this financial opportunity, we train more young journalists and we improve the capacity and resilience of our team uh, with these trainings. So, um, yeah, but maybe we do some research about uh, is there any methodological chains of fact checkers after the collaborations? It, it, it will would be quite a good idea, I think. Yeah, I think now that many of us have been working with technology companies for longer, it would be possible to look at the kind of whole corpus of our fact checks and see whether anything has changed. Um, Nishant, you're a keen observer of impact. What's your perspective on this question about independence and editorial impact? Yeah, thank you, Phoebe. So, I mean, unfortunately, this problem of editorial bias, um, either unwilling or willing, is not just a problem in fact checking, but it's a problem in uh, all of journalism um, and all of the media. Um, I wish there weren't vested interests uh, in the media, but there are. Um, and that results in uh, people, you know, editorial teams biasing themselves towards funders, towards corporate interests, um, often towards government. So, I think. Um, all we can really seek to do is to insulate uh, against those um, possible interests. Um, so, I mean, looking at the full facts partnership with Facebook, which is the one I know the most about. Um, I know that Facebook doesn't have 
any control over what's fact checked, um, that those fact checks are uploaded um, without Facebook reviewing them um, to the platform. And, and those safeguards, I think, put in place, um, uh, yeah, an insulation against possible influence. Um, uh, but, you know, still there is the risk that more resourcing is going to what's on Facebook and you're being dragged away from other important issues. I mean, if you look at um, the Mail and Guardian in South Africa, um, the Guardian in the UK, many other um, uh, media organizations are funded um, to cover specific topics, right? In the case of the Guardian and the Mail and Guardian, um, they're funded to cover health topics. Um, and their health desks have grown uh, uh, over time because of that. Um, of course, health is a critical uh, issue in the public interest to cover, but it's always unclear what the opportunity cost is of not covering, I don't know, financial crime um, or election interference uh, or other issues that may get more attention if that, um, if that funding wasn't there. So I think um, it would be uh, beneficial, as has already been suggested, um, by government and others, if we developed, you know, a set of norms that were agreed on by um, by fact checkers, you know, things like the Journalism Trust uh, uh, Index that um, RSF does this or Trust Project, um, you know, for journalism like what is what what are the norms we're willing to accept, and um, if we can agree on those as a sector, it becomes far less about individual negotiations with tech platforms. Mm, that's a really interesting idea. Um, and it kind of brings me on to this question of financial sustainability and perhaps sticking with Nishant on this. Um, perhaps you can bring a wider perspective and explain your thinking on how funders in this space, including internet companies, could support fact checkers which are trying to become more independent. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's a very difficult question. Um, the one of, of financial sustainability. Uh, there really isn't a clear answer yet, I think, on how to do this um, and how to reduce the dependency on, on philanthropy and tech platforms, even as, um, as you're suggesting, they're required to transition to financial sustainability. Um, so a few things, I think, to think about here. One, uh, COVID has massively increased uh, the public uh, understanding, I think, of the role that fact checkers play and how important those those roles are. Um, it's become very, very clear, a sort of life or death clear, that um, having the facts at hand is, is critical. And I don't think that was necessarily as important an issue to people during elections um, uh, in recent times. The second is that um, there's been a trend um, in journalism around membership using individuals in, in audiences to both help produce and distribute content. And you know, a lot of kind of diehard journalists don't like the idea of consulting their readers before they publish things. Um, but, you know, David Farenthold did it really, really well um, in the US. The correspondents are doing it very well, getting tips, um, getting, getting some of their data from um, audience members as well. And then those communities become advocates for that content. Um, so thinking about the role that COVID has played in elevating the importance of fact-checking, one can think about, well, what, what are the ways in which we can get more people into the fact-checking community? Um, you know, Verified, which is a recent initiative by the UN um, in partnership with Purpose, which is a campaign agency, um, and also in partnership with First Draft, um, they recruit information volunteers, you know, and they send them four pieces of, um, or I think it's actually at the moment, one piece of COVID-related information every day, which they can then share on Instagram stories, on WhatsApp, and so on. And and this group of information volunteers has become advocates there. Um, so, you know, how can you use uh, how can you use the communities, and then ultimately potentially get revenue from them as well if they, if they understand and believe in what you're doing. And then lastly, um, you know, while facts um, are facts and shouldn't be sold, per se, there are sellable products, um, I think, that can be innovated. So, um, again, using full fact as an example, uh, the automated fact-checking work that's been done there, that's a kind of, that's a tool which I'm sure TV news networks and others can actually use 
to um, ensure their fact checking is more effective. Um, and and we just which is a larger audience, and that's the kind of tool which I think people are willing to pay for. So you can, I think, you, I think you can develop innovations around specific services and tools without without necessarily having to sell um, and hold the truth. Mm, great, thank you. That's fascinating. And I'd like to pick up on the point about communities because I think Gulen um, at Tayet, you do you do have a strong emphasis on community building, and I wondered if you could talk a bit about that and how it relates to your financial model. Yeah, um, we are really care about the uh, emphasize on the sustainability and what kind of model we can uh, sustain. Uh, Tate is a social enterprise and has an impact on the Turkish social enterprise ecosystem also. So I want to mention again the state of fact checker support here because uh, for profit organizations are increasing according to the report. But in the report, uh, there isn't any um, option or mention for social enterprise, as I remembered. Uh, and I only know that Maldito Bulo is also a social enterprise. And if I don't know, uh, and if there are any other fact check organizations define itself social enterprise, please reach, reach Tate and we can uh, dis discuss more. And we really care a social economy and circular economy because um, this business model we hope um, for the future we can use the money that came from the platforms to increase our social impact with investing other works we are doing or helping other social enterprises we are working with so creating an impact together we can uh, collaborate different actors um, so like Habertürk uh, one of the biggest TV channels in Turkey. And we can put our videos on the public transportation screens. And we can collaborate with uh, different social innovation platforms and different startups with this uh, impact. So it's really important uh, to creating this impact. With the power, power of our um, social impact, uh, we feel responsible to the others. For example, when we organize an event, we work with a social enterprise funded by Syrian refugees in Turkey. Or when we need promotion materials, for example, we work in a social enterprise that helps women or people with disabilities. Uh, so um, it's really important to turning this income uh, to an advantage for all and focus on creating social benefits. This increase and diversifies our financial and um, financial resource and collaboration potential. So secondly, we focus on how can we efficiently invest platforms money to expand fact-checking media or information ecosystem because we use this money to create a community and starting an incubation program called Factory. Uh, we need to understand uh, we are not alone in this hard work and we have to, uh, and many uh, fact-checkers financially bonded to the social media platforms, uh, but we can use this um, this opportunity till they have gone and uh, to create powerful community who support, who support us in the future. So uh, from our perspectives with, uh, with the incubation program we try to build, uh, we will both intellectually and financially strengthen the fact-checking and media industry. So this allows us um, to fund uh, our business and attract investors' attentions to the fact-checking organizations and provide more support from our users. So it's, it's really uh, try to um, find different uh, models uh, and encourage the other uh, social media and other uh, social enterprises in our country. Mm. I think it's amazing how you think of um, scaling fact checks as kind of scaling the social impact of your work as well. Um, I think that's really Thank amazing you. thing that, that many of us could learn more from. Um, and then Tiana, coming to you for your, your point earlier about the regional differences in the way that fact checkers are treated by internet companies. I wondered if you could talk us through your experience and you know how you think we should be responding to this as a group. 
Sure. So I think group response is a really important point in, in, in this whole discussion because there is a, there is power in numbers for sure, always when, when you come when it comes to this uh, uh, how you position certain regions uh, in, in terms of like online visibility, uh, inclusiveness and, and being a part of, of the conversation and part of the solutions because definitely our region is is to a large degree a part of the problem. This information is really rampant here. And this this comes from a lot of factors like uh, very unstable, still young and still not really functioning democracies, a lot of influences that kind of come from different from different directions in here. And uh, then we have high unemployment that makes producing fake news a very uh, desirable business model for a lot of young people, unfortunately. And uh, we we have become somewhat famous for that during the presidential elections in, in, in the US in 2016. Uh, However, there's more of that. There's more of that. And uh, the, the way that our environment is, is that a lot of this is shared across borders because of the same or similar languages and because we used to be like a, a lot of us a part of, of one same country. So what we do regionally is that we connect with each other. We have a regional network of, of fact checkers, but still when it comes to how the company sees us, Facebook predominantly, because this is still a dominant social media platform in the region. Uh, it does not, uh, it does not, it does not resonate with them. Uh, there was, there is only one uh, fact checker from the region that is onboarded to the third party fact checking program. And uh, the reason for that is that it's a member of uh, our European Union. Uh, it's our partner from Croatia that has been onboarded in the eve of the European Parliament elections. So again, there are very specific uh, uh, reasons which uh, influence tech companies decisions on how much money or effort or time or even attention to put into certain parts of the world. So the response from, from the fact-checking community, I think, should come from making these bigger and, and smaller alliances. IFCN, of course, is the biggest one. It's the one that's kind of a roof uh, fact-checking community, and it's very global. But I think there's a lot of uh, uh, advantage to come from from joining forces in these smaller parts uh, of the world that have uh, certain similar circumstances that share the same problems and can benefit from from working together, which is our experience here. And there's also something that I think is really important is for for uh, fact checkers on any kind of uh, of level when they cooperate that they should insist on. Uh, tech companies abiding by their own proclaimed standards, proclaimed policies, uh, being uh, consistent across uh, across different uh, how they call it those surfaces of the platform, uh, providing more transparency, uh, providing the same transparency regardless of where you come from or like what language do you use, etc. So these are think are very important uh, points to to uh, insist on when when speaking to these really really gigantic uh, companies. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, region, more kind of regional collaboration is something that is going to be discussed later on in this conference, perhaps on Thursday. I think there'll be another session on that. Um, and it seems like something that we should all be thinking much more about um, in, in our approach to internet companies, as well as other things that have been discussed, you know, kind of um, the profile of fact checking, kind of solidarity against harassment and all these sorts of things. Oh, for sure. Um, great. Thanks, Tiana. Um, and then Another kind of question related to this for Eric this time. How do you think that fact checkers can make the most of the money that's coming in now from internet companies and funders to protect ourselves for the future? I think it's really important for fact checkers to sort of build audiences and invest in audience building so that uh, it becomes a value add. So it's not just looking at uh, this piece of content, is it true, is it false, and then moving on to the next one. It's, it's sort of explaining why. And I, I feel like uh, one thing that we need to do is to build communities, uh, especially around the content that we produce, so that we have a way to, to get people uh, to engage with us beyond what they're seeing on, our, uh, on the, the different platforms. So one of the things that... Uh, is absolutely essential is to, as, as Gulen mentioned, is to build uh, a team of content producers because ultimately we know that uh, we are essentially engineering ourselves out of a job, especially considering uh, how much automated fact-checking is uh, developing as, as days go by so that uh, you have 
these, uh, especially for the tech companies, they want to do this, uh, the fact checking as quickly as possible. So it's uh, imperative on them to sort of take out the human element at some point. So if we go beyond just saying, is this true or is this false? And then explaining, like, uh, if you see this photo, this is how you can tell that it's been manipulated and then giving the context. So not just saying this photo was published on this day and it was published on this platform, but you give people a way, a, a, an explainer. So it's sort of building a storytelling uh, tool or, or storytelling using the fact checking content. So it's not just, it, it goes beyond the verdict. So building communities and engaging with audiences in ways that will get them to appreciate the value of factual information. And the other thing is that uh, we also need to sort of build uh, on top of the, uh, the, the factors that we're doing and use them as ways to engage with people in other countries. So uh, like I mentioned, one of the things that uh, the, our engagement with Facebook has enabled us to do is to get uh, us to, uh, to build our presence in other countries. So by actually growing fact-checking initiatives in countries that may not necessarily have this sort of ecosystem in place, we can essentially transplant the work of fact-checking into other places. So we couldn't have done that on our own. And uh, we're part of an initiative called Code for Africa, which is a network of civic tech uh, initiatives in a couple of African countries, in I think it's 22 African countries. And uh, by building on these networks and then funding it using the, in the income that we're getting from Facebook, we're able to get or to build initiatives in other places so that our work goes beyond ourselves and beyond our geographical reach. So growing audiences, not just where we are, but also where we want to be. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, and Govind, I wondered if you had any thoughts about this question. Where should we be investing funds that we have now to protect ourselves in future? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I mean, Eric uh, has uh, said it and so has Gulen. I mean, you know, it, this is about communities and audiences. I mean, we are not a tech tool or a substitute for a tech tool till the technology finds a way to engineer us out of the system or the design, uh, as uh, as was mentioned. So uh, it, it, it's... It also, in some ways, goes back to why we started this, and and that's important. I mean, at the cost of reputation, uh, where we come from. I mean, many of us are journalists. Uh, I've been journalists. I've been a financial journalist, but I've done that for more than two decades now. And to me, the the core objective of uh, telling a story, uh, telling the truth, holding truth to power, is the same. And uh, this is maybe a vehicle that we are using presently. And when I say vehicle, I'm talking about the whole uh, the the work of fact checking. And uh, we need to use uh, the resources that we have today to continue to build that. Now, if I look at my uh, my old media world, uh, there were only two sources of revenue. Either there was advertising or there was uh, consumers or subscribers or subscription. And the ratio differ dip differed uh, or varied depending on what kind of product it was, television, newspaper, and so on. Um, if uh, today this is in some ways a third uh, revenue source, but I don't think uh, we should forget about the first two. So it's uh, in, in principally we have to uh, go back or I mean, we are not going back. We are uh, uh, keeping one eye firmly on that and saying, OK, how do we develop uh, consumer revenue or subscription revenue? If not, then advertising revenue. Uh, advertising revenue is not necessarily bad by principle. It's about it's only when it starts influencing your product or your content uh, decidedly, then there is a problem with it. So uh, I think the, the resources that we are uh, we are we have access to thanks to our partnerships are helping us in two or three ways. One is to uh, go back to our principles and stay committed to our principles, remind ourselves that, you know, this is why we are doing this and continue to do it. And third is uh, to say, how do we both take what we are doing, expand what we are doing to newer audiences? As, and when I say newer audiences, I also mean geographically. For instance, uh, we are also uh, we've had the privilege of uh, uh, running small operations in uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar, and uh, and uh, uh, you know, and using that learning back to really create new products and new offerings. So, fact checking and fake news busting is a new thing, and uh, it's only maybe three or four years old in the way we know it today. And there are more people getting into it. But I think uh, it, it, this is something that we have to evolve ourselves. Uh, you know, we do more explainers today than we ever did before. We do a lot, far more video explainers where we question experts on something on video than we ever did before. And actually, we're doing a hell of a lot more post-COVID. So this is something that we may not have thought of and perhaps didn't exist in our scheme of things. But 
this is where we need to use our resources well to test the definition to expand the definition and to take it to new consumers and don't not forget the old models uh, uh, and that and that, that's critical at least i keep reminding myself i mean you know we are at least some of us who think of ourselves as media organizations have to remember uh, where the bread originally came from or the butter yeah yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I really liked what you're saying about going back to our principles and connecting them to these partnerships that we have now. Because I think there are a huge number of positive benefits that we get out of partnering and collaborating with internet technology companies. Um, and it's good to kind of be proud of those. Because um, I think sometimes they sort of get caught up in criticism from a kind of wider ecosystem and the media. Um, and then we're going to move on quickly to talk about Fact Checker's approach to working with internet companies. Um, and whether there's any room for working more collectively. Um, so Tiana, I'm wondering whether you think it's feasible or desirable to try to exert more control over how our work is used online by internet companies. I definitely do, but I would even attempt to, to give a solution for that or like a, a model of how that should be done because it's, a, it's an immensely complex problem. It, it, it entails a lot of it like, um, encompasses a lot of uh, uh, questions that are really broader questions of the media today in the digital environment, not just the, the fact checking community, because you, you want uh, you have this like balance between public interest, you want your fact checks to reach as much people as possible, as many people as possible, you want it to have as profound impact as it can have, especially when it's about situations like this pandemic that, that we're facing where it, it can influence the, the 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 health and safety of people or it can influence an outcome of an election etc so you want this you want this to reach a broad audience and you need uh, tech companies to do that because without them this is in in today's wor world almost impossible on the other hand if you're not a non-profit if you're not uh, financed from some kind of a project-based model or uh, a crowd uh, funding model you also need to be financially sustainable so there's um, there's some sometimes there are uh, uh, tensions between these two uh, factors in in your work and then uh, uh, if you if you rely on advertisement that's been mentioned a couple of times during this conversation you know what uh, what uh, uh, how how disrupted the advertisement model in the media has been by the digital companies so this is this is uh, uh, some erosion that that came from i don't know google and facebook monopolizing basically online advertisement that affects you for sure if you're any kind of media outlet uh, uh, let alone a small fact checking outlet so then you the, the conversation to be had is full of these like really hard questions and i think it's important to have the community discuss them and then talk talk about them with with the tech companies because and it really needs to be well thought through because we've seen attempts like uh, the attempt from the media to kind of start charging Google, for example, for the snippets of, of their news articles that uh, that you get in, in your Google search that did not go well for, for the media outlets that try to do that. So there's a, there's like, a, it's a minefield. There's like a lot of things that you can step on in this process. So that's why my, my main point about this would be, it's really important that we talk about this to each other and bring in our different experiences uh, starting from how we finance our work and, and our business models to the, to our experience with tech companies and our specific media and disinformation environments and come up with, with solutions that, that would really be uh, uh, beneficial for, for most, if not all of us. Mm, great. And Gulen, um, finally on this question, what do you think we're missing by taking more of an individual approach when we could be working together more often? Um, actually, I think uh, we can do more collectively because as I um, asking uh, maybe a few minutes ago, because I don't know how many social enterprise uh, in this fact checking community. So it's just show us uh, we have different kind of um, strategies and income models or uh, editorial strategies. Uh, of course, we uh, don't have to uh, decide everything together, but uh, I think we can um, naturally came together to more um, just discussing what we can do more and not depending with the social media platforms or platforms. So I think it's uh, very important to come together uh, within the framework of our uh, common goals 
but we don't have to force uh, getting together and deciding all strategies um, we are uh, going to uh, take. Uh, yes, this, this is my idea to tackling with the uh, collective uh, decisions. Great, thank you. So we're just gonna take a few audience questions now. And the first one I'm gonna to go to Nishant um, to help us with. And the question is, um, I'm not sure if I know who it's from, um, but it's a question about dependency of fact-checking organizations on platforms like Facebook, and whether this kind of revenue limits our ability to hold these funders to account or these partners to account. Thanks, Phoebe. Um, well, I just want to start by saying, um, restating what you just said, which was that you know, the collaborations with platforms do have their advantages. Um, certainly, you know, you can, as a fact checker, have uh, influence um, over an arena that a few years ago um, uh, was you, you were excluded from um, in terms of a collaboration anyway. So there is the chance for impact and for influence there. It's not just revenue for revenue's sake, in my opinion. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that there are other organizations who are explicitly aiming to hold the platforms to account. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that a fact checker shouldn't play that role. I think fact checkers um, continue to have an important um, role to play around holding the platforms to account, but they're not the only ones doing it. And I wonder whether you know collaborations across the sector could allow them to do that where they're seeing um, you know, issues that need to be tackled. So for example, the markup, um, which is a new uh, publication um, in the US that specifically look, looking at um, the impact that technology is having on society, um, they, they have you know, data scientists and journalists who work together in order to, to try and achieve that goal. The Citizens is a new uh, startup in the UK um, uh, led by Carol Kudwala and Jess Search, who, and, and they're looking at ways to, to work um, legally and journalistically to, um, to address platform accountability. Reset, which is um, a new initiative which Luminate has set up um, specifically to advocate for the appropriate regulation of tech platforms um, and the democratization, the democratization of, the, of the internet, um, specifically of the platforms. Um, is, is, is another initiative. So I think you can't um, put the burden of accountability all on fact checkers, um, and I don't think that's fair. So as a sector, I hope we can cover off any blind spots that are created by these partnerships. Yeah, and I think that kind of comes back to my question about how funders might coordinate to help fact checkers with this question of independence by kind of funding you know, other organizations within the same space that aren't necessarily doing the same thing. Um, and next I'd like to go to Tiana for a question about um, safety. And the question is, how would you protect independent, transparent journalism when it comes to safety due to reporting or debunking misinformation? In terms of online platforms? Yeah, yeah. So, this, this is a really good question. I mean, it comes in a, in a very appropriate time because we have seen, for example, during the pandemic, uh, the, the, the spread of conspiracy theories that are really very radicalizing and aggressive. And they, they have put fact checkers in particular uh, in and like, uh, they turned us into a target of an unprecedented unprecedented level of uh, harassment, threats, etc. So uh, for the platforms to kind of not react to that in any way was a bit uh, not not that great situation for us uh, uh, while it happened because that's where it happened. It happens on Facebook, it happens in comments, it happens in messages, etc. So I think that platforms should be kind of uh, keeping their eyes open when it comes to, especially when they have partners who do fact checking and uh, uh, this exposes them to more harassment and more threats or even legal battles because people perceive their work as censorship or they perceive their work as uh, hampering freedom of speech and freedom of expression, et cetera, which is all, all these processes are happening uh, uh, as a byproduct of, of third party fact checking. A partnership. So this is something that I think should be kept in mind that that uh, 
uh, you when you are onboarded on a program like this, uh, a lot of uh, actors perceive you as someone who has power. While you are not really in reality that powerful, you are more exposed to to uh, certain bad behavior online. And uh, I don't really see companies uh, uh, putting in place any mechanisms to, to, to protect you from that. So so starting from that, I think would be a good thing. Like start from your own program and, and figure out like how to do, how to create a more safe environment for someone who is participating in it. Yeah, great. Thank you, Tiana. And then finally, um, before we go to wrap up, we've only got about five minutes left. I wanted to ask Eric a question. Um, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to alter it slightly because otherwise it's probably a bit too general, um, but it's about how fact-checking can improve in Africa. Um, and I would like to see whether you could answer that question, um, you know, within the kind of confines of this panel, which is about internet scale fact-checking. I think it's really important to uh, understand the fact that a lot of people are getting the information now through these internet platforms. So you have uh, a lot of people getting the news from Twitter or Facebook or like the first thing they do when they hear something has happened is they go on to Google it. And uh, at the same time, we're also seeing a lot of closures and shutdowns of newsrooms. Like just yesterday in Kenya, there's two newsrooms that basically laid off all their staff. And uh, so people are getting more information from the platforms and uh, the traditional media is suffering, especially during this pandemic. And so one of the main things that uh, we can do to, I'd say, to improve fact-checking in Africa is to get more people doing the work of fact-checking and to get more people involved in the, the sourcing of false information so that we understand exactly what people are, are facing or what people are, are seeing in terms of false information. So one of the main things that uh, could help is for us to basically understand how people are seeing this false information, which platforms are seeing it on. So that's going to involve what's, uh, that's going to inform the sort of in, uh, interventions that we try to put in place. And the other thing that uh, we also need to understand is there's a lot of different uh, geographical contexts that we need to work in. So for example, Kenya, where I am, there's a lot of, there's a really high internet penetration, there's a very high uh, level of literacy, but Ethiopia, where we just expanded to in May, uh, has a lot less uh, in terms of internet penetration. They only have one internet service provider, and they also have a relatively low, um, comparatively, uh, level of literacy. So in terms of fact-checking, we also need to start like building media and information literacy in a way that is sustainable and that can be uh, sustained for a really long time. So we need to take each country as it is and then also try to build on top of what fact-checkers in the, in the continent are doing. So we need to work to grow uh, homegrown fact-checking initiatives so that uh, we have people on the ground in these countries actually doing the, the tough work of checking the facts. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Thank you, Eric. Um, so we've got three minutes left, and I'd like to give everyone a chance to quickly wrap up and make some closing remarks. And in particular, I'd love to hear whether you think there's one thing that fact-checkers should be getting together and asking for collectively. Um, and I'm going to ask Gulen to go first. Um, I think it's the, the one thing is demanding transparency from the platforms and for fact checkers uh, finding uh, different sustainability models and uh, keep up good work. Great. Thanks, Gulen. Uh, and Nishant? Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me on the panel. In my mind, I think the one thing that fact checkers should be asking for is access to the data which shows the impact that fact checkers have on the platforms. How does fact checking affect traffic? How do different types of fact check affect traffic, you know, in terms of the way they're put, the, the labels or statements, how timely they are? Because with that data, um, you know, fact checkers can be more effective and more compelling to their audiences and we can hopefully reduce the problem of misinformation as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, thank you, Nishant. And Tiana? Well, I concur with both Gulen and Nishant's uh, uh, points. Transparency is important. Access to data is important. Uh, having some kind of uh, better access to data for researchers of all sorts is something that the companies really should be doing. And definitely uh, think about equity and think about uh, same and consistent approach to partnerships and to to making the platforms better when it comes to, to fight with for well, against uh, disinformation. 
Great, thanks, Fiona. And Eric? So I think we need to push for more transparency in terms of uh, better communication with the audiences, the people seeing the fact checks, and better communication with the people doing the fact checking themselves, so that we know what the long-term plan for this pro uh, the different programs is, and then also we get to understand that, uh, we get to plan better around how the platforms are planning to work around it. But I'd say we need to work, uh, we need to collaborate to push the platforms to be more accountable for the information. Great. Thank you, Eric. That's great. And finally, Govind. Thanks. So, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about the supply side. So I think, see, if we want to make the internet safer, which we all want to, we should focus on the demand side, which is to say, how can those of us who consume the internet and particularly our children, younger people, how can they be trained or educated in classrooms or in schools and colleges to know what to consume and how to consume and what to reject? Uh, if they should reject it increasingly as they should, whether it's on the internet or social platforms, which are uh, a subset of that. The second thing I think is that we definitely need, and this is, I, I, I said in the beginning, this is an evolving uh, matter. Uh, we need better quality uh, data and insights. Uh, sometimes we don't know what we need, but uh, as we discuss, as we collaborate with the platforms, uh, they can help us understand what we need. And uh, the more real time it gets and the closer to source it gets, the better it is and helps us uh, in our fight against misinformation. And you know, finally, uh, and no one uh, asked us to set up fact checking outfits. I mean, we. We, we thought, uh, we saw a gap, uh, we felt that we wanted to fill it in some ways uh, and feel good about it. And that really is uh, is the bottom line. If we, uh, we as, as long as we're committed to this fight, uh, we're committed to uh, improving uh, the quality of uh, what we see and share on the internet, we're committed to better quality or better journalism. I think uh, that's really what matters at the end of the day. And everyone who can be a partner in our effort to do this is most welcome. Great, I completely agree. Um, well, thank you so much to everyone who's participated and especially our amazing, thoughtful panellists. Uh, we'll actually be following up some of these conversations with a workshop next week. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited about continuing that conversation then. Um, so thanks to everyone who's listened and participated. Bye.